Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. WA Real follows the oldest form of learning, that of listening to the experience and stories of those around us. Why is that? So we can explore these stories, so we can find our true self in there. Today, my guest is teacher and children author, Shelley Turnbull. Shelley, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Hello, how are you doing, Bryn? I'm very well, I'm very well. So, um, you're here, based here in WA as well, up near yeah. Hillary's. How yeah. are you finding the contained life here in Western Australia? I'm built for this. <laughs> I'm a writer, <laughs> so, you know, we're going, oh, do, do I have to go out? I'd rather be sitting around in my, in my pyjamas and coming up with another story rather than actually going out there in the real world and talking to people. I, I didn't realise this becoming a writer that I would have to talk to people more. And I, yeah, that bit I don't like. Um, I, um, I like talking to kids, which is great, but predominantly most of my audiences seem to consist of adults and I don't like talking to them. So Why this is that? really nice. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I, kids are, I, I'm just used to them. Um, I think when I first started teaching, I was the same. I had to give a 15 minute, you know, when you do your practicum, you have to do a 15 minute, your very first lesson. And it was terrifying. Um, obviously after doing this for years, kids are no longer terrifying because I'm used to them. And now I have to deal with a whole new audience. And I, adults' expectations are just very different. Um, adults ask you, are they kid like when I go and talk to kids and they want to talk about the book and then they want to ask personal questions, they will ask me things like, What's my least favorite vegetable? and um, do I have any dogs? Well, it's my least favorite vegetable. I ha and then the next kid will ask me what my most favorite vegetable is, which are you know, they're, they're okay, I can handle those questions, but adults do sometimes. Um, kids ask you big questions. But they, they're, they're kind. Um, I, where, yeah, which uh, I, I think adults want to, they want to know how you do something and they want to know it. And they want the, uh, how do I, I explain this? Um, when adults say, like, what, what's your formula for writing? So mm -hmm. where do you get your ideas from? And I don't know, I had cheese last night and had a bad dream and it was a great idea. So I wrote it down that I, I there isn't a formula. Um, I, I do often, I love Neil Gaiman's answer to that question. It, she says every Friday at about 7 p.m. A, a, a small person in an admiral's uniform shows up and hands him a brown envelope full of ideas. Um, kids don't ask you those questions and, and they don't get disappointed with your answers. That In fact, the only thing they get disappointed with is if you don't like what they like. Right. So, if I don't like dragons as much as they do, they're a little bit, because they really did expect me to like dragons. And I, I, yeah, and I think also I don't have pointy ears. That's a huge disappointment for some of them, because I think a few of them do really expect me to have pointy ears. So. <laughs> That's fascinating though, isn't it? The, the difference in questions. Mm. And um, yeah, the sort of lack of imagination and wanting a more material answer. Yeah, yeah, and, and the formula, whereas kids will go, they will actually ask you, like, how did you start that? How did you get, they get more specific and they get excited. They just get excited with uh, simple ideas and, and just first steps. They just want to know the first step. They don't want to know everything. Um, and if they do ask you big um, things, it really is about their personal big things. They're not uh, industrial big things like, you know, how many, you know, they don't really care if I write 20 books or 10 books or two books. They really just want to know what the next one is. So they're, 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 they're in the moment. So, yeah. 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 And I suppose sometimes some of the questions I can imagine that you get from adults are uh, either A, can't be answered, as in where'd you get your ideas from, mm -hmm. or B, can sometimes miss the point. Yeah, and, and I think adults, because adults come in with a different agenda. Adults, because I'm a children's writer, 
Um, maybe it's different for writers for of adults where their audience is interested in the story and um, the the author author's thoughts on the ideas they have in the story. But people come, adults come and listen to me because they want to be children's writers. Okay. Or they are other teachers who want to know how to, and, and you know, they get excited I'm a teacher too, so I should know how to um, do my book as a class study. And I go, it's, it's, my brain doesn't go there. I, I think I didn't write the book so that children would have to um, deconstruct it. Uh, yeah, no. you know, I do look at books and I go, yes, we'll do this to Jane Austen and here's Shakespeare. He's been done to death, but we'll do more of this on him. But, yeah, I, I'm sure William Shakespeare just wrote his plays to be enjoyed and I write my books to be enjoyed. And I, I think I read books for children that are all about teaching them things, teaching them how to be better children so that might be better adults. And, yeah, yeah. they're not my favourite children's books. So mm, The moral of the story, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think you can't help put your own thoughts about life in any way. But I think if you're slamming people around the head with it, that's not a fun book. No, no, no. So I don't really, I, I was asked by Bloomsbury to put a little package together of stuff, things, kids to, to do in class because teachers like it. And I really struggled. Whereas I think you could give me any other book and I wouldn't. So it, that's, yeah, that's, in, it's an interesting thing because my brain, it, yes, obviously left, right brain or whatever it is now, it just splits. No, I'm writing a story because I like story. I just, yeah, you ask me to think too much, I think, sometimes, adults. How did you get into writing children's books? I have always wanted to be a children's writer. Um, I, I always wanted to be a writer. I remember writing poems about snails and slugs and all those fun things kids like when I was about five or six. And when I was 10, when I actually knew what the word publish meant, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be a published writer. And I think my biggest mistake and the biggest, the best thing I did and the worst thing I did was go and study creative writing at uni because I learned skills that everybody wanted to be Tim Winton and I wanted to write for children. And it's no, 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 no. You want to write the great Australian novel. And so I tried to pretend that I wanted to write a great Australian novel and I failed dismally. Um, and yeah, so, and, and it put me off for quite a long time because I was trying to be a real writer until I remembered that children are a real, real writer and children are a real audience and they're an important audience. And I, if I hadn't had books as a kid, I swear I would not have survived my childhood. I, I, well, I, 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 I did have a bit of a rough childhood. I, when I got to here to Australia, in, in the UK, it was great. But, um, yeah, I, I, if I just say I went to Belga High School, I think for a lot of Perth listeners, they'll kind of get that. It was rough. Um, and um, we lived in state housing, um, which is, you know, you can have some really nice neighbours. But my mum always said that you put people in pigsties, they're going to behave like pigs. And, um, and there was a lot, I remember going to my, uh, a, a school ball, year 10, and um, we lived in the, the an, awful, an awful big block of flats. And there was a man with a fence picket sticking out, out of him on the boy that took me to the ball. <laughs> he walked past this man in a lot of pain. They had just had a big fight in the middle of the, and, and I was surrounded by people who didn't read. And I did really correlate between reading. And I, w one thing that really stuck me, C.S. Lewis said, that was um, if you give, you know, in real life, and I can't quote him, but it, the idea is so with me. If kids are going to face troubles and they're going to face bad people, then you want to give them books so that they can see how heroes behave and they can see how you overcome. And so for me, being surrounded by people who didn't read, my mum was a great reader, so I got it from her, but pretty much everyone else was not. And um, like my stepfathers, uh, one was not really like me, he, would, he could read, but he didn't. And one of my stepfathers was not even functionally literate. Well, he was functionally literate. I think he could fill in forms. 
Um, and so looking at the lives of people who didn't read and the lives of people who did read and, and moving towards them um, it was a re made a huge difference for me. And I really think, um, you know, I, I would be one of the few people I know that went to high school that has got a university education. And I was really glad. I left, I left um, high school in year 11 because I actually couldn't do study. I couldn't go home and study. There was an awful lot going on. And so I was a cleaner for a few years until someone told me you could actually go back to school, which I was really excited by. And so I did my TEE, which ages me no end, at Stuart College. And I now finally got to go to university. And because I, I think that was brilliant too, because if I had gone through from year 11, teachers are very practical creatures. So they want you to do nursing and they want you to do you know, something that will make you gainfully employed. Even when I went to, to Stuart, the teacher went around the room and said, what do you want to do when you finish? And it was, I want to be an engineer, I want to get into medicine, I want to be... Good solid jobs. Good solid jobs. And I went, I want to be a writer. And she went, well, that's not very practical, is it? And I remember thinking at the time, oh, no, probably not. And I still agree with her. She's right. It's not a very practical job, but, you know, who cares? Um, and so I did creative writing. And it's, it's very hard to get a gain, gainful employment as a creative writer. So teaching, but I love teaching. So it was, it, was, it was a good job. But if I had gone straight through, as you do, I would have done something practical. And, my, you know, this is my heart's desire. I've always wanted to be a writer. So n not doing it the straight way, having a few blips in the road. I think one of the things that you asked me were... As, you know, about is there anything on your journey that, um, or failings or something? And I'm thinking at the time it felt like a, like a mistake and I wouldn't finish school and all of that. But in hindsight, it's brilliant. So, you know, I did, I did the wrong thing. I went and did creative writing and I'm very happy for having done that. The very wrong right thing. The very wrong right thing. So if I have, I've had done the sensible thing, I think, yeah, would I have? Would I be as happy as I am now? I don't know. I think I was made for this, so very, very happy. Excellent. So, right, I'm probably going to ask you a really adult question now. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> so, how, how as an adult do you write kids' books? How as an adult? I was a kid once. Yeah. And so, does this help you to stay connected to your childhood? But very much, and um, obviously the things that I'm writing are very ch child-centred. So I am, yeah, I am very much, and I think being a teacher too, I'm constantly in contact with mm. my audience. So I remember what it's like, and I, re I think maybe because I had a bit of a rough upbringing, I remember it. Um, your childhood stays with you forever, whichever way it is. Like my husband had a wonderful childhood. So he's constantly taking me to places where he had great time. You know, this is where I went, you know, dirt biking through the bush. And this is where I went fishing with my grandfather. So his childhood is still there, still very, looms very large in his mind. Um, and so I actually think it's not as hard for people to get in contact with, what it is to write for a child, just to remember what their childhood was, because it does stay with you. Hmm. So. Something quite interestingly deep about that, isn't it? Oh, is that, yeah. I think, yeah, your childhood lasts forever, which is why I think you have to be very careful with children, because they will remember. So yeah. Yeah, I love that saying, not that, um, sorry, I see. I, work with teenagers can you tell um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um it says children will survive anything and i think that's true i think there is some sense of uh because they don't understand they think in concrete there is a kind of protective bubble around them while they're children but the adult they become which is why i think teen years are very difficult for both parents and teenager is the concrete becomes abstract and they start understanding the things that happen to them so you often have a child that survives, but the adult that grows out of that child is still quite hurt or yes. um, wounded or, or um, liberated by whatever happened in their childhood. So you do carry it with you for a long time. It almost seems like part of, you know, having sat and listened to, and I don't want to become like all Freudian here, 
Yeah, yeah. But, um, having sat through 140 plus episodes of listening yeah. to people's stories, there is, it almost seems that some of the things that you take on during your childhood are part of what will then make you yeah. or not make you yeah. as an adult. And, yeah. you know, I love one of the greatest things that I got introduced to was um, blaming your parents or blaming yeah. your childhood has a shelf life. And if you're still doing it past 30, mm -hmm. you have a bloody good I, word with yourself. Most definitely, because you're the adult now. So mm -hmm. it is your job to make sure that the next generation of adults have a better, better, better time, basically. Mm -hmm. So they come up. And I, but at the other extreme, I look at people who are very mature, you know, very adult, and, and especially the ones who can't stand children. <laughs> I go, what kind of child were you? <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I find that really hard because you were, every adult, you know, was a child once. And unless they were really revolting and remember themselves as really revolting, which is possible because I have met some really revolting children and I have met some really revolting adults. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm from wondering if there's a link to it. Um, I, I go, I, I, you know, when people ask that question, how do you write for children? I don't see that it would be very hard for too many people unless you are really rejecting your childhood and often i think that comes out of not getting over it yeah so so there's almost that what's coming up for me right now is it's almost like there's a kid's book in everybody that they should there's write there's a kid's oh, book in everybody yeah. that they should write yeah and i write in fantasy because what sort of things do you cover in your books and just for the person who's oh. The listener who's not listened to uh, met you before, you, you yeah. go under T.C. Shelley. That's me, yeah. Yes. I, I do write fantasy. I do write fairy tales because I think if you want the biggest messages, and here am I completely, completely um, contradicting myself from earlier. I will take that on board. Um, fairy tale. Life, life is a myriad of contradictions. Yeah, cognitive <laughs> dissonance all the time. I fairy tales are a way of teaching really but it's warning people those mid no you know those old wives tales were about warning kids without terrifying them so red riding hood for an adult you know the wolf is not the wolf you know exactly what he symbolizes and you don't want your little girls and your little boys talking to that wolf out in the middle of the forest when they're by themselves. In fact, you're probably not interested in them meeting him even when you're with them because we know what the wolf symbolizes. But we don't sit down with our eight-year-olds and our nine-year-olds and say, this is what the wolf means. The wolf is, please stay away from wolves. They won't be hairy, but you want to stay away from them. What what fairy tales do is actually give you a way of cloaking those very big ideas without frightening the children so they give give you lovely metaphors whereas i think you know by 11 or 12 um you can start telling them the truth without it being in a costume Yes. But up until then, I think you want you want you're you're keeping these two things in a real tight tension, protecting the innocence of childhood and pre protecting their innocence individually. So fairy tales are a really wonderful way of doing that. So in my books, because I the books that I like I said safely were the books that actually threw really big themes at me. So life, death. Um, dissolution, wisdom, they weren't the stories that told me to just be a nice girl. In fact, they were the stories that told me to speak up. And they, I remember very distinctly understanding this, which is something that comes through. In fact, one of my characters says it in the book. Um, uh, the, the, the main character says, well, what is love? And the, his, one of his helpers said, love is wanting someone to be the best version of themselves. Because there are people who will emotionally be very, very invested in you. And it will be for very, very different reasons. So they will say they love you because their feelings for you are powerful. 
But if it's not their intention for you to be the best version of you, they don't love you enough. Um, and I remember thinking that very thought in those words when I was 12. So somebody in a book taught me that. Wasn't, and because I was dealing with adults around me who wanted me to be like them. Um, and again, I'm going to say, like, because if my mum ever hears this, my mum is not my mum, was my lifesaver and an absolute love, but there were a lot of people around. You know, when you get kids at school who, you know, if you want to fit in with us, you'll do these things, the peer group pressure. And you go, you don't really like me. You actually want me to do the rotten things that you're doing because you want me to be like you and make you feel better about you doing those things. Mm -mm, I don't want those friends. Oh, you're in adulthood, don't worry. Yes, yeah, it doesn't go away. I, you, I meet bullies, the same peer group group bullies in adulthood. It doesn't go away. This whole notion that it stays in the schoolyard is 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 a myth. You will meet adults. Your bosses will do it. I I have a friend at the moment, same name as me, Shelley, who is oh gosh, now now she's going to be embarrassed. Um, who her. The people she works with, she has one of those people is actually like that. And 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 you go and and adults will talk about it, we're debriefing. And really, if we could just say it the way he's bullying me, <laughs> you know, he's a bully. And I don't want to do that, but you know, and when they become your boss. You, ha you have to figure out methods to deal with this person. And th th I think the first method is just recognising it. Yeah. The best method, even if you're st stuck in a situation with toxic people, is at least to know that they are. Yeah. Sometimes you can't walk away from it straight away. Eventually, hopefully you love yourself enough to get yourself out of there. But sometimes, and for kids, that's exactly, sometimes you cannot walk away from a toxic situation. And that's why I really, you know, kids get stuck in a situation where they have the least amount of power. So they have to have their most amount of knowledge, I think. So you tell them and you wrap it up in a fairy tale, but you give them heroes and you give them villains and you show them how villains behave and you give them the language that helps them survive those situations. So books did that for me and I just wanted to do the same thing. So to me, yeah, children's stories are really important. So writing the great Australian novel, for whatever reason, was very important at uni and I forgot what was important to me and I, it took me a little while to remember it. And that's why my, it's taken me so long to get published because, yeah, um, hmm. I don't know what to say after that. I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um, that's why I write. Um, and, yeah, uh, I think uh, that's why I write. What, what I'm writing and where it's coming from is not always so easy to... to, to does it, um, and, again, I might be... Tell me if I'm being over adult here because I'm, I'm really... Might be, you might be. Yeah. Does it does it often come with a with a fairy tale first, or does it come with a little message first, and then the fairy tale gets woven over, or is it mixed? All right, now you're asking. You see, you're asking how does it present it? Don't I couldn't give again. I've had dreams, and I've I had when te when I was oh this I shouldn't admit to this, but I'm gonna. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, um, people talk about post post um, natal depression, so that's the big one. Everyone knows about that. And we know about prenatal. When I was pregnant with Tess, I was, oh my goodness, I was preparing for it. Other people, other women were painting the nursery pink or blue or, or yellow, whatever the colour was, orange if you wanted it. I was preparing for multiple apocalypses. Okay, so I, I was... Um, I went to see, <laughs> heavily pregnant, went to see Alien versus Predator with my friend Jen. And she knew I was getting like this. So at the stage where there's this stage where this alien puts its hand up against the window of a nursery and you know it's just looking at all the candy inside, which is just, she literally physically bodily separated herself from my view of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> at that point in time. And I would start working through. So if aliens, aliens, um, uh, you know, invade, this is how I will do it. To the point, and my husband called it my zombie box, I had a box of food and a four-litre bottle of distilled water in the baby's room 
in in the cupboard just in case I needed to self isolate. See, I've been preparing this for eight. There you years. go. Um, just in case I the box in the water is gone now. I think it did take till she was about six months old before I moved it. But I really was, and it was anything I saw. I would be, I would be like, just in case. So, you know, it was not a serene time for me. I have an overactive imagination and I do work well in crises. Um, the problem with it was I kept, I saw, um, I saw, um, oh, I, I saw a film, Man Eating Ants, bad move. So you can see I really, really needed to watch what I put in my, um, my brain. I kept having this repeated nightmare of this small child in the middle of this swarm of ants coming towards them. And it was a terrifying dream and, and I was powerless and, and I sat down, that was the one, um, when she was, it just kept coming and coming and she must have been that year old. And I sat down and I wrote it out. I wrote the whole book out, moving from the beginning of the book to this scene where I basically have my main character save this baby out of the middle of this problem and then obviously end the book and I wrote that book in 30 days 90,000 words right. while I had a very small baby that's where that came from um, this book came from my daughter asked me a question we were watching Tinkerbell and she said mummy and I I'm to the point I can now quote this because people ask if fairies are born from a first love where do monsters come from so I wrote her a book so that came from somebody asking me a question um, I have other books that start as a short story because because when I got my agent, she said, "Oh, you've written this book. Do you have any others?" I'm like, "Oh, I have like a folder, like about ten books that are all finished in a folder. Some of them are for adults, and some of them for a, a young adults, and some of them. This one was middle school because this is the one my daughter wanted me to publish. That's why. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, she went, "Oh." can I have all of those? And I, I gave her the synopsis, but I'm a bit precious. I don't, don't really want you seeing my book till I've edited it 10 times. So she's still asking me for these books. Um, and because I've been working on this trilogy, that my, my editor has been getting all of my attention. So my agent's getting like, every now and then I get a, have you started editing anything else? Not yet. So, or I have a little bit, but I'm not telling her that. She may hear this. I should take that back. <laughs> I'm not working on anything else. Just doing what my editor's telling me to. <laughs> but yeah, look, I can't tell you. Seriously, I had a recurring nightmare that came out of this very bizarre. Um, yeah, I, I, I did think to myself, I better not tell my friends. <laughs> They're going, James, do you think the bunny rugs with the yellow rib or the one with the nice edging? And I'm going, you know, I'm just stocking up in lentils and rice. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so they really must, like, well, look, it's interesting because I more and more I buy into the idea that there's, Rather than we have ideas, there are ideas out there and then we just channel into them, yeah. collect into them and they can come in lots yeah. of different strange ways, whether it's an epiphany in the shower or somebody yeah. asking you a question. Yeah. Yeah. One thing on the TV makes you go, oh. Yeah. Yeah, well, that word inspiration comes from that. It's the spirit residing. So the spirit comes from outside of you and resides in you. So mm. that's where the word inspiration comes from. So the notion of a muse living in your walls. Yeah, I, um, I, I think um, I heard, who, I, who was it, the, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love? She talks about that, about, mm. and the fact that the Greeks had this, the Greeks had the muse, the Greeks had this notion of inspiration, um, meant that it was less, uh, there was less demand on the artist to come up with something. So what are you doing next? Well, I don't know. I'm just waiting around for the muse to tell me what she wants. Um, it, there's much less pressure. And I must admit, I kind of go with that too. I like to, I like the idea of being conduit, like a gargoyle, you know, for water. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I really do have the opposite of whatever writer's block is. I really have no problem <laughs> coming up with ideas. So... I actually have to constantly file them. Like I've got this one at the moment that wants me to write it and I've really got to and think. That, right there, what you just said is lovely. I've got this idea that wants me to write it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, 
that's exactly that's answer. why you don't have writer's block because it's not all or it's not all it's not, yeah yeah no, i'm not i'm not i'm not like demanding of myself to come up with an idea they just they pop up and maybe maybe you're maybe it is like you know they're just popping up going she'll listen to me because she's not spending all her time trying to find me so mm -hmm. And trying to make me into what she wants me to be, she'll just sit there and wait, and I'll just attack her in the shower. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is there a um, has there been any um, corona isolation ideas start springing up? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh look, I have been, I have been. Um, I love the whole notion of post-apocalyptic and so, so yeah, the notion of um, being the last man on earth, you know, Mary Shelley, the, la the, the whole notion of um, being, an, uh, yeah, no, those, those stories are dime a dozen, but people have done them. So you really have to um, come up with, and it did come up and I no, that's the one that wants to write it um, because it was something somebody said on Twitter about um, Donald Trump talking about the virus being a genius and, and saying, are we anthropomorphizing? Yeah, I can't say that word. Um, the virus now. And somebody saying, well, it is a genius. It's certainly cleverer than Donald Trump, you know, and they're doing all the anti-Trumpisms. And, um, and then I made a post and I went, oh, because I was just being, that's my job. I just get online and make stupid comments. Um, and I went, the moment I saw what I'd written, I went, oh, yeah, that, that's what I'm going to do with the virus. And it is not this, it's not going to be about self-isolation. It was just something said about Trump, something said about him personifying the virus. And then I'm, yeah, see, I'm, I'm backing down to personify because I can't say the other word. Um, yeah. and, um, and I went, yeah, yeah, no, I'm going there. Yeah, and that's the, that's the story that wants me to write it. So it's more adult and yeah, and, and the thing about it is there are, I think I, I remember hearing JK Rowling, the, the first Harry Potter came to her on a train almost complete. So is this one, this one has come. I know where it starts, I know where it ends. And sure. um, whereas with Monster, no, I started with this idea and then I had to find a character to wrap this concept around. And then, um, and it was interesting because some of the reviews of Sam have been, because he is, he is literally born in the first few pages and it is very hard to give someone a personality who has just arrived. And some people have said that. And um, it, that initially is quite passive. And I thought it made me think because we really aren't, we don't like our passive main characters. And yet if you think about Oliver Twist, Oliver Twist is a book about a lot of people being very proactive to protect him. And yet he just kind of rides through it. So, um, so my Sam, for at least the first couple of chapters, is a bit like Oliver Twist. He just rides through it until he gets to the sense of what it is to make, he, until he gets to want something. You've got to want something to be able to decide something. So, yeah, I, I don't know how I got there. Um, went off. <laughs> So, um, as well as being the author, you're a teacher. Yep. And yep. interestingly, right now, um, you're coming into your own, aren't you? I am. I am. I spent Why 10 years teaching online. So, well before this, I, I, am, I am splendid isolation. I have always enjoyed it. I actually, sometimes interacting with kids in class, because I have to do the classroom management stuff, I am not good at that. I, I, I admit I'm okay, because I'm 20 plus years of teaching, but there are people who are much better. But I taught for two, uh, two schools at one point, one based in Sheffield in the UK and one here in Perth. And I was teaching GCSEs, A-levels and to the British curriculum while I was teaching to the West Australian curriculum here. Um, and one of the things I did, it was, and it was again, me not asking questions, me assuming when I got offered the job, it was hilarious because the principal of the school came here and he was traveling his um, online stuff around um, 
uh, Australia and he was just looking at what other schools were doing and I really found it fascinating what he was presenting and I went up and said how do I get a job in your school and he said you have to work in Britain you, you know if you want to teach um, to the British curriculum and I kind of forgot about this and I went to the UK I actually went to uh, um, I went to New Orleans for a little while went and lived there for a little while and worked on a um, in a, a school that um, I guess, you know, they call them the projects over there, just for a little while, helping someone write stuff to get people positive thinking. So kids who have been chucked out of every school to get them to do some positive thinking, which I'm um, really for changing your mind, cha changing your brain and your mind simultaneously. Um, and then I ended up in the UK and ended up in a British school teaching in Derby, Derbyshire. And, um, and the principal of this school, because something I'd said to him had really resonated with him about the medium of teaching online, um, which is why I was so fascinated by it, showed up on my doorstep and offered me a job. And I went, yes, yes, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. And so what he did was forwarded the last teacher's work for me. And it was all Word documents. And I went, well, that's a bit boring. And I learned, believe it or not, I learned how to build websites. And um, I got myself some accounts with animation and I made them like a little bit more interactive. I found out that and this is over to the, uh, yeah, late, late 1900s. So, so the technology is not quite as good as it is now, but, and I sent the kids this on CDs so that they would go lesson one and it would open up lesson two and learnt all the stuff that, that we're, you know, not as much as I could. I didn't do it brilliantly, but um, three clicks. You don't want to be any more than three clicks away from your destination. I learned these four things, and this is the thing that the, these four things you need to include if you want a good online lesson. They've got to see something, they've got to hear something, they've got to interact with something, and they've got to do something. Now, those are four separate things, but they can often be. Combined. So if you give a video, that's obviously seeing and hearing simultaneously. You can do something interactive. So that could be seeing and um, interaction and, and obviously interaction and doing a test. So you want to keep it, you want to give them. So a lot of what my, my daughter's getting is a lot of, um, I think the, the science teacher's giving her a lot of interactive stuff. And it's a lot of closed stuff, fill in this box, fill in this box, fill in this box. But um, science really does online lend itself to, because um, there's so many great websites. Um, FET at FET.colorado.com, I don't know what P-H-E-T stands for, that's how you spell FET, is an interactive, um, it shows videos of um, science um, experiments. And I think the kids can interact, obviously not being a science teacher, I haven't looked at it very well, but some schools are using that. So there you've got something to see, something to hear. Um, and a little bit of interaction. Whereas if all you're doing is sending kids Word documents, they will disengage very quickly, very, very quickly. And really all you're asking of them when you're doing that is comprehension. Yes. So every lesson I've got, I've got, and, and you don't have to make it yourself. So there's now, 20 years later, um, yeah, yeah, literally 20, because I was doing this in the late 1900s. I was pretty much making everything. I, I downloaded a new animation program for myself because there's a few things I want to make. But I learned how to um, use animation software. So I have um, little videos, and they still exist online, of Julius Caesar with my voice changed. Um, I found software that could deepen my voice, and I made a friend with the guy that built the software. Oh, it's hilarious because he... He, um, he emails a standard survey and said, how would you alter this software? You know, do you have any suggestions? And I emailed this huge email back of, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you make the voices do this? Can you do this? And can you do, you know, and one, three of the things I did, because he, it was a, it was a game of software. So you put it on, changed your voice, you sounded like an orc, or you put it on, you sound, you sounded, and, and for, you know, people, they just want to play online, they want to get into the character. So I said to him, can you make it so that we can overlay backing sounds? So if I'm going to be in a forest, I want to sound like I'm in a forest. So yeah. can I put a media file? And can you do a fade so it can sound like I'm moving closer and further away? And can you, and one of the ones I asked him, can you make it so it sounds like I'm talking underwater? 
because I wanted to do, um, I wanted to do, what was it? I can't even remember the text I wanted to do, but it was like had, you know, underwater, probably Moby Dick or something like that. So, you know, I wanted an interviewer, but um, I used it to do these Julius Caesar. So Julius Caesar runs through each act and just gives a summary against a PowerPoint of what's going on. So something to see, something to listen to, then you give them the work. Um, and, and you don't even have to do that anymore. Like, so that was me learning at that stage because there wasn't that stuff out there, but there are YouTube videos and there are Vimeo videos. And the one I'm using with my kids at the moment, Macbeth is called My Shakespeare. And it's brilliant because there's, they've got the whole of Macbeth set up the scenes and a lot of them are interviews. So this guy Ralph interviews the three witches to ask them why they tell Macbeth what they do so it really makes it easier to engage so there's something to listen to something to see now can you tell me what you know bank while Macbeth was discussing and because Shakespeare's hard online I mean having a teacher go through it in class is hard but if it's done and it's and that stuff is funny so so in and give them less than you think you need to give them that's my other advice because teachers do feel that they need to keep kids working imagine right now because they don't <laughs> because you don't have that um, human natural instinct to have yeah. a classroom so yeah. you can control yeah. things. Like, yeah. well, you need to do this and you need to do this. And you need to yeah, do yeah, this. yeah. I mean, and, it, it's interesting because, where was it, I read it recently, that if you, took, if you took somebody from 100 years ago and pulled them into modern day, yeah. um, everything would be unrecognisable apart from school. Yeah. And so is yeah. this now a great opportunity for us to seriously look at how like we're schooling how yeah. we do schooling yeah well i actually thought like, let's have a look at the kids that succeed in this environment um because there will be some that will really flourish there will be some that will really flounder and oh nice little bit of alliteration there um there will be some that really flounder and there are some there's some situations where yeah you you actually start looking at the kids that need less of that more of that um, mm. so some kids, some teachers are going, the kid that does nothing in my class is suddenly fully engaged. And the kid that's most engaged is completely gone, disappeared. Um, and, and parents, I do have to tell you, um, you don't have to check everything the kid does. What would make it useful for the teachers is if you check their assignments. And I don't mean check to see if it's right or wrong, just check to see if it's done. So if you know what assignments are due, um, and teachers are trying and, and have a look at the kids' assignment sheets and just get your kid to show you they've done that. And you don't have to read the whole thing, just randomly pick a question. Um, because I have one parent who thinks not looking at the work is enough that she can see her son upload um, the work. And he has uploaded blank documents to us all. So very clever boy. <laughs> Mum has seen him upload it. And, um, and also kids think they know what they're doing. And I would say your year 11s and 12s, you will probably get lost unless it's your subject. So I'm all, all well and good for checking Tess's work if it's year 11 and 12 level lit, but obviously it's not. It's good, but I couldn't check a maths. But if she says to me, and, and the moment, fortunately, she's doing year seven, so I go, Right, um, I can look at her year seven maths and go, yeah, I get this and it doesn't look right to me. So, um, uh, but she will say, no, 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 that's what the teacher told me. And I'll go, are you sure that's what the teacher told me? And uh, told you. And, and I have found that generally in that situation, I'm right. That that's uh, the teacher, because ma maths is, you know, like you say, if, if, that you took the person out 100 years, mass hasn't changed. Mass is extended, so you're hmm. probably getting more calculus now and, and trigonometry than you might have got at the end of the industrial era. And literature has changed in the sense that the focus of it in the upper school, but that's all upper school stuff. If your kids are year 10 and under, um, yeah, maths hasn't changed. You still divide the same way. You still multiply the same way. Algebra is yeah. still the same. So if you remember it and it looks, you know, it, but some parents really are lost. They've forgotten anything that they learned after they were 10. 
but most of us are actually functionally more numerous and literate than we give ourselves credit for mm. um, so yeah so it, it is interesting just, you don't have to check everything just check that the assignments actually done and that they're sending it to the teacher that's that's really all parents need to do at home because the day-to-day -day stuff will actually come out in the assignment if you're checking your kids assignment they actually need to do all the stuff leading up to it to get the assignment right yeah. so so um you, you're actually yeah just so because i know a lot of parents at home going i am you know i've got to work i'm still working from home i can't check my kids stuff well actually it should self-run fairly well Hmm. Um, and but the only issue is if that that's why I think it's interesting teachers seem to be giving the kids more to do but it's of a lower level because it's very hard to to be the explainer because that's a huge part of what teachers do in classroom which is why going and having a look at seeing it, someone explain it for you on the internet is not a bad thing using Vimeo and and YouTube go and find it there's lots out there lots and lots and lots and that, that, who's that brilliant math australian math guy get all his videos i can't remember him he was at scribblers a couple of years ago so i've forgotten his name because obviously not math teacher if he was an english teacher i know him backwards and forwards yeah, backwards and forwards yeah so what are some of the what are some of the common mistakes that parents might be making at the moment that they've got to check everything they've got to be on top they've got of to check everything they've got to be almost like the quasi teacher yeah they've got to be the quasi teacher um uh, kids are going to be really anxious so um and and i think both teachers and parents have got to do this this is for some kids they will flourish for other kids they are going to flounder and the most important thing about your child is their stress levels. Okay, your child, the human being, this, this too shall pass. And parents go, they'll lose, you lose a whole year of schooling. And, and <laughs> if your child loses a whole year of schooling, it's a far better option than them ending up with a serious anxiety disorder. You know, really. Um, you prioritize if your child is getting so stressed by this bring it back and if the teachers not going to do that for you um, you know and some uh, teachers are panicking too that's the other thing teachers are this is very unfamiliar territory for a lot of yeah, teachers know, and so they're anxious and they're wanting to do right by your child so be gentle on them they are not overloading your child and and also if if you if the kid says I don't understand electricity and you go I don't understand electricity either if your teacher is not providing that um, conversation again you go and find it go and tell your child go and research it go and find a video where someone explains it to you because ninety percent of it ninety five percent of it is already out there somebody's already wanted to explain this to their kids. Um, uh, there's a, a flipped classroom. The flipped classroom is a concept that I think is about 10, 15 years old, where teachers would actually put their stuff up on video on YouTube and Vimeo and actually explain the concept and the, uh, the kid at home. The kid would learn the concept there and then would come to the class and discuss it and do the homework and do the work. So they would actually come into class a full bottle and that. So there's an awful lot of that material out there. There's an awful lot. So if your kid doesn't know something, you don't know it, somebody out there knows it. It's really okay. And, and this is time, maybe the most important thing for your child to learn is their web searching skills. Um, so, you know, when Tess says algebra and he's doing it differently, I thought, let's go and find somebody who's teaching that concept. So mm. it is out there, there's a lot out there. So yeah, for both parents and, and if you don't know anything about Macbeth, so parents, but we, I have, I, the biggest thing is dealing with pan, pan, parents who are panicking, parents who aren't coping with the technology. So it's not the material, it's the technology that's actually throwing a lot of people, both teachers, parents, or not both, because the kids, there's some kids who don't cope with the technology either. That is not their literacy. And we assume because, you know, you're 10 and you, you know, the, the, you know, the mythology of the child who can use the DVD and set it up for granddad. Yes, that is, there's a high correlation between age and technical skills, but it's a high correlation. It's not 100%. There are some kids who are panicking too. Right. 
Mm. I guess um, just even listening to you for a lot of parents, that would be a big... <sighs> <laughs> prioritise, prioritise. Your child's mental health is the most important thing. Your yeah. mental health is the most important thing. Yeah. Um, and you know, even I, I, I don't know if what they're doing, they're doing in the U S but I've heard that they basically, I, they haven't done it here. We still have to assess things, but I know that things like, um, I had a moderation due this year and that's been deferred till 2021 because the government are understanding teachers are understanding this may all fall apart because we don't know what we're doing. Um, I, I, I actually think I should quit my job as a teacher and actually just go PD teachers on how to do this and how to do it in a way that's fun for them and, and find the materials, stop trying to reinvent the world. Because what we do, we've got everybody's, there, there's some things you have to make, like the how to use our technology video. Um, you really do have to make that. like Because... Um, um, uh, like at Tessa School, the, the sector program they've got, I'm very familiar with as a teacher. I've been looking at it before. Um, but some parents are going, and they're on Facebook, they know how to use that. And they're going, ah. Um, and, and I must admit, the first learning management system, LMS, that I used was something called Moodle, which was very similar to Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I put stuff on there and send them my discs, which were interactive and you make it simple. Just find the index page. That's, you know, everything, everything's got to be simple. No more than three clicks. Um, and that's the big thing. So if kids are having to do five clicks, I, I test his French assignment. Um, the French teacher was going, just do this, find, do the assignment and do this. And Tess was panicking because she couldn't find the assignment. And the poor man, I was like, calm down, we'll find it. He put it in term two instead of term one. That was all. Really easy mistake. Um, but of course, at home, and I have a, a child who's really, really wants to do well at school. So for her, it's a bit of a... So, so that's what happens. You, you know, there's anxiety for all sorts of reasons. And the most important thing is to bring the anxiety down first. Yeah. Nice. Then yeah, the more the more the higher the anxiety, the the less you learn. Doesn't matter. The less you learn because the more you think. Yeah. Is there an opportunity here for us to um, understand more how different people learn and unlock that? Because you know, and I did this podcast to throw bricks at the education system, but it it is one person front of room puts message out. Yeah. Yeah. Through class classroom full of kids. Yeah. And, you know, I was I was really lucky, and because there was a, a teacher, there were two teachers uh, in my life. I'm going to name them: Jill Anstey when I was nine, and then another guy at twelve called Robert Noble. And Robert Noble helped me to understand how to revise for tests. Right? Ah, good and skill. Yeah. And he unlocked the world at that point the world to me because previously i just thought i'll just read my book and it'll be in there and then i'll go and do the test and then yeah, yeah. and it will go into my head and it was and it wasn't so now he was like no no seriously try and find something interesting and then try and find the key part the, the points and then boil it down and then see if you can write those down without having your book open yeah. write down as much as you can and then have another look and then see it and he, but he was always drilling back yeah. yeah. try and find it's something interesting and that that, that piece of advice there went yeah. on to me passing my common entrance at the age of 13, which was one of the most difficult things in the world yeah, to do. Yeah, well done. Uh, GCSEs, A-levels, bachelor's degree, master's yeah. degree. All thanks to that piece of advice. Now, if I had not got that... Mm. And it is, it is amazing when you get the aha moment. And it is amazing a teach, as a teacher when you see the aha moment. Yeah. Like, I've, I've and, had and kids, yeah. Because of that... I was able to learn how I learned yeah, and then see the results. And then all of a sudden I went from back of class in terms of grades to front of class. And I was like, wow. holy crap. Well, it and it was, it just, there's the key. Yeah, blue. It's a beautiful thing. Well, I think you'll find uh, in this, cause my husband, like I said, my husband's working through the night. He's nocturnal. He was good at high school, but when he hit uni, just went, <sighs> Because he'd have late afternoon lectures and he would do his assignments through the night because he's a nocturnal beast. And I would suspect that some of my students will be getting out of bed at 11 o'clock in the morning 
and yes they'll miss my live lectures which is okay because we record them and they put them up but they will be doing my assignment till late and then other kids will be getting up but I have one student who says and she's a brilliant student and see this she says I don't work in the mornings and two of my um says I, I do work at an experimental school by the way so that, that whole industrial um that kids in straight lines we don't do that mm. um uh, it's, it is, and, and I probably, I, I think considering I would be the most conservative member of the staff, I think I only got in because I write. <laughs> but, um, and so I, I look, I, I look, I, I look pretty conservative, but obviously something's going on in there um, that's uh, a little outside the box. So I think I got it because everybody else is really quite hipster and funky and, and I'm really not. And, um, but the kids are too, like we have kids, they, can, they come with their hair, the, you know, the pink hair, and then the next day they come with it shaved and they do have a kind of uniform. It's, they have to wear the same top, but, um, but mostly is, it, it's very, the, the first thing we prioritise is the children's mental health. Mm. So if this child says to me, I cannot work this morning, I actually listen to that. And the fact is, is that, I, and I have said to her, I, you, but be you produce. So I'm happy to receive that. She does, she produces all the assignments. They are always top class. She doesn't work well in the morning. I said, but you have to do something to make, look like I'm at least make, forcing you to engage, you know, so that everybody else doesn't pull the same trick. So it is very much a negotiation and I negotiate all my assignments. Um, generally, because I'm new at this school, the kids have not, been courageous enough to um, really take that on board, um, especially the older ones. The younger ones have, the younger ones go, ah, oh, because I go, read my criteria first, which forces them to read the criteria because kids don't read assessment criteria. You put a number at the end and they don't even know what you've given them the number for. They just know whether they're good, average or bad. But if I say, if you read the criteria and you go, if I do this, this, this and this, it hits the criteria here. So it teaches them some negotiation skills. It teaches them to read the criteria and it teaches them that I just want those criteria assessed. So if I'm looking at your technical skills, your literacy technical skills, you're obviously gonna to have to write something. But if I've said you have to make me, uh, you know, write me a story and you really want to do a newspaper article on such and such, well, it's up for negotiation as long as my criteria are hit. Um, so mm -hmm. it is very much, a, you know, and the younger ones have like, I gave them an assessment um, before we went away, which was a group assessment. So that kind of got them a moratorium. But by this stage, my students were going, oh, can we do it this way? 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 Yes, of course you can do it that way. Most definitely. Um, in English, that's quite easy because English is a skill-based subject. Yeah. Um, I, but I still think there's lots of room for negotiation in, in other subjects too. So, and also one of the best ways that is, is actually getting the kids to build the assessment. So from the beginning. Right. Uh, we, we're going to learn this. I need to learn this. What do you think would be a good assessment to, to, um, to assess? Which is actually, again, easier in classroom. Very hard to do that online because yes. there's 24 kids, 28 kids all over the shop and some of them haven't gotten up yet. So, yeah. What have you, um, what have you been learning about yourself in this uh, coronavirus disrupted environment? Oh, well that, that would be hard to say because I probably already pre-learned those things as far as the corona is concerned. As a parent, um, um, I... Uh, uh, it's it probably probably keeping on again keeping on top of the exercise that would be the big one because um, I write and now I'm sitting in front of the computer teaching whereas I would do my writing and then I would go and you know I, I don't sit down at school you yes know, they just circle like a shark you know making yeah. sure that they're not on roadblocks and and clash of plans which is like that that was so last year but Roblox and minecraft which is the thing is is they can put rob um both of those because they're really good maths learning tools so but not my not my class buddy um yeah. 
but um, yeah, so so I don't sit down at school. So I get a lot of paces going, whereas now it's moving from uh, writing time because that's what I do first thing and then moving into um, teaching. And um, so getting up and making sure I move is a big one. Um, yeah, and making sure that Tess moves and making sure that we walk the dogs and making sure everybody, everybody's getting their exercise, which is really... Because I heard on the radio they're predicting that we're going to put on 30 million kilos as a nation over this. So <laughs> as long as it's not all on me, I'm good. <laughs> I don't mind a couple of those, but not all of them. Yeah, I heard. Was it? And there's gonna be a lot of people that come out pregnant or looking. Oh, pregnant. yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's probably gonna be a big one. Um, yeah, but, um, and they're gonna call them Generation Corona, like the babies that are all born next year, yes. next year. Next year yeah, and yeah, the coronials. That's right. Yeah, and yes, um, this is a worldwide thing. So that definitely will be the next generation. So. <laughs> what um, What are some of the things you do to keep you grounded at the moment? It, oh. Grounded. I'd say that's never been a pursuit of mine. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I, I think you, one of the things you asked me is that, that um, on the surveys talk about, and mine is very much, I have this personal philosophy that happiness is the pursuit of discomfort. Um, it is not the pursuit of um, comfort, which we have, you know, if I had more money, if I was better looking, if I had all the right things happening for me, then I'd be happy. And I, I think that it's the opposite. I think we're moving. So it's actually things like this I love. I, I mean, you know, if the car breaks down, I have said to Tess, you know, you can't have a story unless something goes wrong. <laughs> So you can't like, if I, and I tell this, this is my big thing. Cause I have, there's two things I took it's because in year seven and I'm sorry, it really is stereotypical, but boys write all the action stuff and I don't care. And it's not the action that I don't care about. It's the character. So they have, you know, that opens with the guy falling out of the airplane and, and his parachute not opening and then landing in the forest and suddenly nine ninjas jump on him. And at no point, and it's, that, that's all great fun, but at no, no point has this character made a decision, have they decided something, have I engaged with the character? So there's a lot of action going on and no character involvement. And girls have this, their eyes met across the room, he asked her out, she asked him out, they went out, they were like, like great boyfriend and girlfriend and then they grew up and got married. And on both ways I'm going... <sighs> You have to have characters you love and you have to put them through a problem. And yeah. once you've got the first yeah, problem, you got to make the problem bigger. And then it's got to get worse. So not only does the character have to fall out of the airplane, he has got to come to the, like, I'm just going to pull my ripcord. No, there's no, but how am I going to, I'm going to aim for the trees. I'm going to do something. I'm going to save my life. So I'm going to get myself so at least I've got a softer landing. Bounce, bounce, bounce through the trees. Okay, I've got to get out of the forest. Oh, no, here come the ninjas. That's far more interesting. So you've got to have both. So this is not a problem, people. This is an adventure. And you will, like you say, what stories come out of it? Okay, you will learn lots about yourself. And so that's part of the adventure. But I, I, that, and that's what I t teach my daughter. You pursue discomfort, do something that scares you a little bit. So like this year, while she was still 11, and, and it was great because people will roar for you like they do for, she bungee jumped. We were in Cairns. She jumped, she went and bungee jumped. She was scared, she was shaking, she walked up the top. But she was already prepared for this because her hobby is trapeze. So, you know, I, I've said, what is going to make you a little bit uncomfortable? And you get to choose what makes you uncomfortable. You get to choose the risk. Um, so when real risks come along that you don't get to choose, you're actually equipped for them. So, yeah, so like getting a book, writing a book is a risk. And it doesn't sound like it's not, you know, obviously nine ninjas aren't going to come and attack me in my office. But <laughs> there's the risk of putting your ideas out there and people thinking you're rubbish. And then you've got to put it, you've got to take it up a notch and put it out there to someone. Because your friends will all tell you good. And your mother thinks you're wonderful. My mother thinks I'm wonderful. Um, and they, but you have to put it out there and get it edited. Like, and that is the first step, people. If you want to write, don't give it to somebody professional until you've had it edited by somebody who doesn't care about you. 
Yes. So you got to put it in the hands of someone who will tell you it's oh, rubbish. Shock it in the mangle. It's shocking. You're not going to get this published. They will do it very nicely, but learn to read between the lines because they will tell you what you do well because they want your money because you pay them for doing it. But simultaneously, they will also, and I did have one on this book who went, oh, no, no, and she literally wrote that. And said, oh, no, not another monster. Please, you've got way too many because I had them coming out of the walls, literally. And she went, it's just too much, pair back. And I had, um, and I wish I'd done that before because the first time I sent a book off, it wasn't this one, the writer went, yeah, you've got pretty good, uh, the editor said, you've got a pretty good start, but your dialogue is just way too loaded. You're, you're obviously getting, you know, you're trying to make, make uh, it, it's stilted. So I went, oh, great, great piece. Like, obviously after she broke my heart. <laughs> But when an editor you pay for comes back and says it won't work, and and I had someone say it won't sell, it won't sell. I went okay, and it won't sell. And she told me because of the premise of it. It wasn't because my writing was bad at character. And I went, and then and I must admit that this was an editor who was American, and Americans are um, the initial premise where I started um, with the initial chapter. I got that because um, there was a bit too many bum jokes. I love bum jokes. Um, Oh, yes, yeah, see, really in touch with my inner child. And, um, and but uh, the Brits aren't so squeamish and Australians aren't so squeamish. I mean, we have Andy Griffith, for goodness sakes, you know, and, and you know, Tim Winton, Bugger Lugs, the bum thief. So that's Tim Winton, isn't it? Um, so, you, you know, Australians and, and the Brits aren't, aren't too worried about bottom jokes for children. But she, um, she said it won't sell. And I thought, okay, I'll take that on board. But what she was telling me was not for reasons that I went, well, because it not because it's crap. Um, and so, and because I sent that the monster in, um, the monster who wasn't in the UK, I sent it to a UK agent. And I, and again, I took a risk. I had a, the list and I, and I, how many times am I willing to hear the word no? That's what I went in with. How many times am I willing to hear the word no before I give up? And I went on sign a line and somebody put that on a website. See, because it's all out there. Don't think of giving up till you've had 80 rejections. Don't give up till you've had 100 and then write the next book. And so I went in with, okay, I, made, I had a list of about 60. And seriously, the first week I got no, 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 no. I went, okay, if I'm going to get told no this often and this frequently, I want to get told no by people I really want to get told no by. Yeah. So I made a list of impossibles, people that I knew would never take me on board as a client and my agent is one of them. Excellent. So, yeah, so I had my list of impossibles and she was, num no, oh, she was number one. She was number one. Catherine, you were number one. So... <laughs> And I seriously, it was just because I've gone through this process of really putting, getting it out there beforehand. So people go, I have this amazing, like, because literally from the time I started looking from an agent to the one I got the one I wanted, it was three weeks, which is like unheard of. But it's because I got all of the, you are crap, you are rubbish, this isn't going to work for the two years beforehand. Mm. Whereas I didn't go straight to the agent. I went through a process of, and even then she went, the email she sent back to me was, this doesn't work, 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 but this is all fixable. Right. And basically also, I think that's my interview, how thick skinned are you? Because hmm. if you can get through the all my list of what doesn't work and you still want to talk to me, then we may have a future. And she is a machine. She is terrifying. So she says, have they done this? I'm going to talk to these people. I'm thinking, I'm so glad you're working for me and not. <laughs> she's, she's brilliant. She's really brilliant. And there she's on my impossibles list and completely could not believe. I thought I was getting one of those email scams when she replied. She was going to ask me for a million Nigerian dollars or something. So. <laughs> <laughs> the last question I ask all my guests. Is... Okay is um, if you could take one nugget and upload it to the collective consciousness right now, so we all just get it, what would that be? Oh, far out. Oh, gosh. Um, oh, it, I got, it's so trite, but it is, just be kind. Be kind to yourself and be kind to other people. 
um, work on the assumption that most people, most people are actually doing their best. So, so in this situation, the Karina situation, the parents who are sending the teachers the panicked email are doing their best. The fact that they're contacting you and saying this. The teachers that are putting the stuff online are doing their best. This is new to them. Um, the kids are doing their best, most of them. Um, and, and the ones that aren't, you, you kind of know the ones that aren't because they didn't before, but there's a lot that I have got that have gone silent. And I know it's because they're probably sitting somewhere in a corner, biting their nails, thinking that I'm really disappointed with them. And, and that's a really huge thing in class, how often kids are waiting for me to be disappointed with them. And I'm thinking, that's really kind of an awful place to be that your first assumption is that that's what I'm thinking when you tell me you don't understand something or you can't get something. And I tell them this, this is, it is not, it is not smart people who don't ask questions. The kids that never get anything are the ones sitting at the back of the room going, I don't get it. But if I tell them I don't get it, I'll look dumb. Whereas the really kid that's getting all the best marks is the kid that, kid that asked me nine things. Yeah. No, yeah, it's not. And, and it's the kid that argues with me. I, I will often say, when the first kid that argues with me, ah, yeah, oh, you're my A student, I can tell. Which makes them go, oh. <laughs> I'll be wrong. I'm on, I'm on, I'm allowed to argue. And argue, not fight. Very big difference. Yes. Be kind. And be kind to yourself and worry about your mental health before you worry about anything else. Most important thing in this situation. Just be kind to yourself, be kind to your children, be kind to their teachers, be kind to everybody because, as you know, and it's an aphorism, that everybody has a story. You know, even the people who are taking four packs of toilet paper. You know, they're panicking. Um, and you're going, you know, the, I did, did say to my husband during that situation, I don't know why toilet paper, because I, I, I was behind, the, I was behind um, the eight ball, obviously, when we were talking about China not giving us toilet paper. Um, I said, I'd be stocking up on rice and lentils because, you know, not a lot of space, lots to drive. For. He came home with about 10 tins of lentils and I was thinking, mm, not quite what I meant. <laughs> 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 but yes so we've got lots of rice and lentils and we are we are okay for it. and it was funny i was down to my last roll of toilet paper went to the shops and there was four there were four bags and i took okay. one and we're still we're still in toilet paper so you know so it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. <laughs> thank you and you too this has been fun i don't get to talk about myself so much <laughs> if people want to come and find you where can they find you Oh, uh, uh, I don't know. Isn't that terrible? Um, I don't have a website. I have Twitter. I'm TC Shelley on one. And there's, I'm obviously the first one on Twitter. I am TC Shelley on Facebook. Please come and say hello. I had, uh, um, I had one lady who, because I, I think... I don't know if you can, um, I will follow you back. I'm, I'm really <laughs> happy to follow you back. Yeah, follow me and I will follow you. We will get lost together. Um, but yeah, I had some lovely lady from Queensland saying, oh, I've read, I've read the book ahead of my kids. And I'm going, I'm so thrilled because I want, I want my stories to be something that adults, the adult, the child grows into the adult and still wants to read. So, and still goes, oh, there was something else there for me. I know I have lots of adult jokes and I mean, you know, jokes that adults will get, not adult jokes in yes. my, so please, I do have Twitter I do have Facebook I don't have a website I know I should I know how to build them but I still don't have one I, I just have too many ideas of what I want to do and then I get overwhelmed so mm. thank you so thank much you. for your time no problems bye Bryn <laughs>